learn how to build a better sign and print shop from a few crusty sign guys who've made more mistakes than they care to admit. Conversations and advice on pricing, sales, marketing, workflow, growth, and more. You're listening to the Better Sign Shop Podcast with your hosts, Peter Kurunis, Mike O'Reilly, and Bryant Gillespie. Before we jump into the episode, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. A big thank you to GCI Digital Imaging, grand format printer to the trade. GCI is not just your average print shop. They pride themselves on providing you with a fast, stress-free experience when outsourcing. Their no excuses mindset means no matter the job, they'll have it done on time, every time. No other vendor will go to the links that GCI does to ensure you're a satisfied customer. To hear more about their approach to business, hop back in the archives to episode nine, where the guys and I interview owner TJ Bedact about top tier customer experience. So if you're looking for a high quality trade printer for banners, mesh, core plast, and more, TJ and his crew have your back. Big or small, GCI does them all. Check them out at printgci.com. Flat cut acrylic letters and logos are a great way to drive impact for your clients and increase your profit margins on a job. They're super simple to install, but are notoriously tough to produce without the right equipment and processes. So why bother yourself when there's a good cut acrylic provider with quick turnaround and great communication? Check out Jayco Wholesale Sign Products at sign.supply slash BSS. They're not scared of intricate designs and their process ensures the edges and corners of your logos or letters are spot on. And that's not all. They offer a variety of mounting options like VHB or stud mount, Pantone matching for those tough clients, acrylic up to one inch thick and fast nationwide shipping. Visit Jayco Wholesale Sign Products at sign.supply slash BSS to get a quote for your next project and mention you heard about them on the show to receive $50 off your first order. Hey guys, welcome back to the next episode. Well, the latest episode of the Better Sign Shop podcast. As always, my co-host, the Sign Shop Yoda, Mr. Pete Karunas. How are you, sir? Hell, hey, hey. What's going on? It's been a while. It How definitely rusty do has. you think we are? Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's like riding a bike. It'll come to me maybe like 10 minutes in. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of developments. Um, I, I, I just heard your big news. We won't share here. Like, it, I, I'm super excited for you. Um, we've had a, a just like personal update. Been a crazy 2024 so far. Uh, we've had like 35 sicknesses on the bingo card. Uh, I'm not sure what's coming next, but uh, it, it's been interesting to say the least. Uh, but personally, like excited to get back in the saddle. You know, lots of cool things going on in the community. We keep growing. Um, I see the numbers shoot up every day. Thankful for that. Yeah. i not not sure what else to update on here. Yeah, I mean, it seems like so long has gone by between episodes here, and you know, we have gotten we we we've we have a lot going on. Both of us are involved in other a lot of different things, a lot of different clients, but it's been mostly the same old, same old. You know, it's uh, yeah, sicknesses go around, but we went through the January and February swoon like everybody else, <laughs> and and coming out of it now, it's like March, the springtime. I feel like a, a revival. I feel like a revival here where. Business is picking up, leads are coming in, not just for the sign and graphics industry, but for everybody. You know, I'm in tune to the home services market. I'm in tune to restaurants. And all of a sudden, it's like people come out of the woodwork, man. They, they stay home during January and February. They don't make a lot of purchases. They're, they're paying off that holiday debt. And well, I'm kind of in that same bucket. I'm as a consumer, as a father, as a, as a husband, you know, it's, you got to manage your expenses. Tax season is on its way. People are getting their refunds. And, it's here, man. It's here. <laughs> it's here. For some of you that did your taxes early, it's here. For me, I kind of i am like one of those lazy guys with it. But, uh, yeah, my refund check is on its way, and I'm going to be putting it back into the economy somehow. And that's what, you know, small business thrives upon. 
I feel like uh, you know, my refund was a lot smaller this year. Thankfully, I didn't have to pay. But like, I, and like when you think about it, like it, you should be like that's less money that you were out of pocket throughout the year. But like getting that big lump sum at the end of the year, like is just like money found, and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's always it is, uh, it, it is kind of, it is kind of found. Uh, looked at like that where it's like oh i just suddenly got all this money and what should i do with it and some people invest it some people put it into their house some people renovations i know it some just didn't feel some people as don't good do anything with it this year oh. like hey, hey you're gonna get like i think it was like 500 bucks <laughs> oh well i have you know let me just say this really quick before we we bring in we bring on our guest here i was having a conversation with a buddy of mine about this yesterday uh, at the time of recording this, the Powerball, the the I think it's Powerball. It could be something else. It's uh, what's the big uh, lotto? Uh, yeah, I think it's Powerball. I think that's what it's called. I I don't play lotto. I don't I don't play. I'm hardly ever involved in it. But I tell my I was telling my buddy this the other day. There is nothing like the euphoric moment of the daydreaming of what happens if you win. You know, here in New York, you, there's a slogan: you got to be in it to win it. You know, so there's like a heavy interest in getting New Yorkers to invest into, you know, playing the lotto. And it's like at this time, it was like seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Right. And it's like, OK, I'm going to take an hour out of my day and think about what tomorrow could look like if I am the one that wins. And that euphoric moment of like, what would I do with all this money? What would I like? Would I close the business? Would I? give buy a house for all of my friends put them all on the same block and make it like one constant party like at 735 million dollars like it it is not life changing it's like five generations worth of life yeah. changing yeah so the That's things nuts. that you could do with that and i start thinking about like okay like you mentioned what happens when mr taxman says ah, this year you made a 500 hundred dollar refund check well what happens if mr taxman says to you hey Congratulations, you won $735 million. It's like, well, um, hmm. so I asked my wife this question. I said, who would be the first person you would call when you would win the lotto? And she, and you want to know what she said? She said, I wouldn't call anybody. Uh, yeah, I'm like, I, I, I'm like I, I don't know where that comes from. I would call like everyone, my mom, my dad, my brother. She's like, no, keep it. I'm going to keep it really close to the chest. And I'm going to tell them, yeah, we want a little bit of money, but we didn't win the whole thing. And yeah. I want to be classified anonymous. I'm like, wow, I really, w I don't know why I married you. I, <laughs> Dude, I, I, I've, got, I've got so much in common with your wife. Like I, you know, I've got, yeah, I, I, I would do the same. I would want to be super anonymous. Like I wouldn't really wouldn't want anybody to know. No, hundred percent. You, you're afraid like people are going to look at you differently or what is it? Uh, just the hassle. Like, so uh, there was a guy in West Virginia years ago and like, we're, we need to get into the guest in, in just a moment. But, uh, there was a guy in West Virginia. I think his name was Jack Whitaker. Like he won a, a giant lottery win. And, uh, it, it's like, we're, we're like last in the nation for like healthcare and all these other indicators a, a, you know, second to only Mississippi or something like that. But uh, he won this thing and it like destroyed his life. Like he, like his family members died. Like he ended up like overdosing, like his granddaughter overdosed. Like, it, yeah, it just wreaked havoc on this dude's life. Uh, I can't remember the total story, but yeah, it was, it was like a life changing amount of money. And then like at the end of it, like before he died, he was like, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Wow, I, I mean that's such an interesting take. I I feel like he he probably didn't manage the money very well, or like he, you know like that amount of money like friends come around, family comes around, everybody wants a piece, um, and you you know you you've got to manage that certainly, but um, just one of those cautionary tales. You, you see those are like all right. So for those listeners out there, I did not win. The Mega Millions, that's what it was. It wasn't called Power Bowls. Mega Millions. I did not win the Mega Millions. I am still here. I'm going to be doing this podcast here. But if you're listening and you did win, yeah, maybe a little donation this way. You know, maybe Brian and I are putting in a lot of hours for free. We're working for nothing here, giving you guys really great content, giving you guys really good insights, bringing on guests. You know, hey, invest. Maybe we can make something happen here. 
Yeah. Let's, on that note, uh, super special guest today. Uh, really impressed with their work. Uh, let's bring him on, Mr. Jim Dawson. All right. Welcome back to the show. We have got our extra special guest, Mr. Jim Dawson of Synergy Sign. Jim, big fan of your work. Um, like the quality and the craftsmanship really comes through. Um, welcome to the, the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, for uh, people who may not be super familiar with your work, and I, at this point, I hope there's a lot of listeners out there that are, uh, why don't you give us a, a little background information about you and your shop? Yeah. So um, I uh, started the shop in my basement 20 years ago. Um, basically, we started with a little Roland SP300 solvent machine and a laminator and a laptop and uh, never dreamed it would turn into what it did. But there's been, you know, some things that, that come up over the years that kind of changed the course of of the way we've went. And, you know, from the very beginning, it's been me and my wife and just out there, you know, drumming up business and trying to build things as good as we can. And um, so here we are 20 years later with a with a big shop and a bunch of equipment and trying to just keep the machine running. So yeah. right, off, right off the bat, I got to ask, what's it like to work with your wife? Uh, it's cool. It's cool. So we, um, we beta roll in the very beginning. It was, she came to work here out of necessity. I had an office manager, um, office manager had some family issues come up, had to leave. So I had her train my wife as kind of a stopgap. Um, until I could find someone else. And it turned out my wife was really good at it. So we get to keep that money now. So, <laughs> so okay. and she's only here two days a week. Um, so it's not like, you know, I'm spending 40 hours a week with her at the shop. And, <laughs> and we, uh, we developed a rule very upfront that when we go home, we don't talk about business. Um, and do you that abide is, by that rule? We do. We do. Wow. We talk very, like, I'd say... I can count a handful of times whenever we've had to go. And typically what it is is she has a friend that needs something. And and she'll say, hey, so-and-so needs something. Call them tomorrow. That's the extent of it. We don't really do business at home. That's awesome. Like, we've had so many – we've had a lot of, like, family-owned shops on the podcast. And, like, it, it, like, that dynamic is always interesting to me. It's like, how do you play it at the shop? How do you play it at home? Um, it, what was I, it? it I watched my mom and dad do it. My dad had a cabinet shop growing up, and I, just, I was like, if 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 our interactions are going to have to go that direction, you're not coming here to work. So, <laughs> yeah. So it was it was one of them things where we just laid some groundwork and to see if it would if it would work, and it's worked out well for us. So that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'm glad. I'm actually glad to hear it. I like that you've put yourself in in with there with some rules, and you. I think that balances not only your professional relationship with your wife, but your personal one as well. Uh, especially if you've been able to do it for twenty years. Is that right? You said twenty years you've been in the yeah. business right now. She's been here for about eight of those, but she was always kind of helped me in the background. Good. Uh, it was eight years ago that she came in, and she basically handles all of our our receivables and pays bills and does a lot of the admin stuff that I absolutely hate. I don't like, I would have quit this business long ago if I had to do that stuff myself because I'm no good at it. Like I'm creative. I am not paper. guy. Well, at least you're self-aware. That's yeah. the battle, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd say, I, Jim, I'd say that you're in a boat with maybe 98% of <laughs> the sign yeah. shop owners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually, you know, listen, uh, it's 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 fascinating to me till this day it's still fascinating i get to meet owners like yourself this is the first time you and i are ever meeting and hearing how you get into this business and you get into it through the creative side and you learn how to be a business owner based basically off of your acquired skill right yeah you said, well, i i i kind of backed into it like it was yeah, not fascinating like, i did not i did not set out to be number one not necessarily a creative um, because I was always really good at math and science in high school. And there was, you know, I'm, I'm that I'm in that generation where you had the guidance counselor beating you in the head, telling you, you got to go to college and you got to get a degree and you've got to do something that, you know, there was, they, nobody talked about trade school then nobody talked about, you know, it was that like, you've got to go to college. You got to do this. You got to do that. And so I did. And two years in, I hated my life and, and ended up transferring out and went to animation school. 
Um, so, and it was the the very beginning, like Toy Story had just came out. So 3D animation was very fledgling at the time. And uh, my dream was, okay, I want to I wanna make Toy Story. I want to be... I want to be an animator, and I want to do everything in 3D. So when I when I got out of college, I found a, a local job. Nobody tells you if you want to be an animator, you got to move to Florida or California, which I didn't at the time. I didn't want to go either place. So I, you know, we had some some family stuff going. I had a sister that was sick. I graduated. I needed to find a job. So I went to work for a uh, a cabinet company doing all their 3D renderings and their designs and everything. And a year in, I ended up being the the head engineer at the cabinet shop. So I don't, I mean, getting into the sign industry backwards through animation school, through being an engineer at a cabinet shop. So figure that out. How did you go from animation to cabinet shop? Are you just like, hey, I needed a job. I don't want to move there. And like, yeah, this so kind of the, came up. I was like, hey, I, I, did you know them or like, no, you saw like I, a job post? Like, answered a job posting, went and met with them. They loved me. Uh, they were just getting into doing 3D parametric design because it was pretty fledgling industry back then too. You know, everybody was still drawn in 2D. Sure. Um, so I came in, started actually 3D modeling everything, and it, it cut out a lot of the guesswork um, because we built stores like Carlton Cards, American Greetings, Joe's Fay Banks, big mall stores. You go in, you measure the store, you 3D model the whole store, and then you break all those 3D models into router programs and you cut the store out and build it. Yeah, and it paid really well too. So I'm like, yeah, I yeah, can okay. yeah. early twenties, <laughs> you know. And it's it's you figure it's nineteen, it's we're two thousand two thousand one, um, and you get offered an engineering job, and it's paying you know fifty thousand a year, and you're in your early twenties. Like you got the, you feel like you, yeah. you know, the world's your oyster at that point. So yeah, you're far from the starving artist. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So oh, cool. Okay, so lead us from a head engineer at the cabinet shop. Things are going well. Why signage? How did how did you fall into so, signage? So we had a hard time at the cabinet shop. So we did a lot of POP, a lot of trade show stuff like that, along with the cabinets, and we always had trouble finding reliable sign vendors. Um, and when we did find a reliable reliable one, they were very very expensive, at least in our eyes, coming from the cabinet industry. Um, so we bought a, a laminator and a printer and uh, got into Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop and started doing our own. And I was pretty much in charge of that. And when I started doing those things, it was, I was like, man, this is way cooler than doing cabinets. So um, when the, some stuff went down, we had a flood at the cabinet shop. They were never really ever uh, able to recover from that. Um, so the place went out of business, and I bought the sign making equipment and moved it into my basement. Got it. Yeah. Out of out of tragedy, the, the rise from the ashes story. There, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. It was, it's uh, a, it's amazing, like how many, like natural disaster type things befall, like sign shops and other, like cabinet shops. I guess. It, how many guys have we interviewed on the podcast where their shop burned down, Pete? Like two or three at this point. I lost count. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, not, not to I mean, not to like pile onto that idea, but like so I, in a period of ninety days, I lost my job. My my sister passes away from breast cancer. She was she was oh nineteen gosh. years old, and then I got married two weeks after that. So it was like there was like this just as much turmoil as you could pack into a ninety day period. It, it was packed in there, buddy. So it was one of them and, things where I'm like, it can't get any worse. We're going to sink or swim. You know, and when you're starting out with a business, it's, you don't have anything. So it's like, ah, let's just take a bunch of risks and see what happens. And if it goes badly, we'll start over. Yeah. So it walk us through like the journey, right? You're in, in your basement or your garage. Uh, when we first talked, you were doing, I, I, you mentioned to me like the, two weeks of like polyester, like brush polyester decals oh, that you were weeding. Yeah. Out. <laughs> so at that, at that point it wasn't, we weren't, weren't picking and choosing our work. It was, we had a lot of contacts in the POP industry and they have needs for small graphics and for things that, uh, that go on fixtures and displays and things. So it turned out we got hooked up with the company that does all of the faucet displays at Lowe's and Home Depot. 
and um, it was Kohler faucets. And they needed these brushed aluminum polyester cut decals to go on thousands of these faucet displays. Um, so, it, you know, it was every time they sent us an order, it'd be for like 5,000 of them. And we probably would do five or six of those orders a year. Um, so it was it was two weeks of we'd invite people over for dinner. Hey, now that dinner, <laughs> these decals. So, <laughs> so and, and was, be careful while you're doing it because yeah, uh, and, and it's amazing when you got to do that many of something. How you figure out like I can put relief cuts here, and that makes my life easier. And I can put a relief cut here, and I can lay the sheets out this way so they're easier to trim to size. And so you not only was weed them and then mask everything and then cut everything to size because they had to they had to register them to the lower corner of the box. So registration had to be perfect. I mean, it was, yeah, I'm glad I don't do those anymore. Yeah. So I, I like talk us through the progression, like got your first customers, like you're moving out of your business or out of your house into a shop. You're hiring people, you, you know? Yeah. So, um, the first move we made, I was, I was, uh, I was approached by a couple of local businessmen that I had done some work for and they loved us, you know, loved the work nobody around like basically the there were no vehicle wraps around yet and there was a local guy that was like an old timer that had a gerber edge um so we were kind of changing things in the area and um they came to me and said hey uh give us a value on all your equipment and everything and we'll put that much in and we'll help you get going and we'll go into the business as thirds i'm like oh this is a great idea i'm gonna get a i'm gonna get a storefront I'm going to be able to hire some people. I'm going to be able to get a new, you know, a little bit of new equipment and stuff. And um, I don't think we made it about a year and I was done. Like they were, they just didn't understand the industry. Um, and they didn't understand um, where I wanted to go, like what my goals and stuff were. Um, so I ended up, I ended up buying them out with the help of a couple uh, family members and uh, so we went ahead and, and bought them out and then moved into um, a different business because I f figured out really quick that, like, having a having a storefront for my kind of work was completely unnecessary. Um, we just... It's a, it, it a common trap, you know, yeah. of like, hey, like, it, it, we're accessible, like, we take walk-in traffic. Um, you know, a lot of those jobs are, could be good, could be bad. Um, yeah. You know, it, what I found in my own experience was, like, a lot of the, the walk-in stuff, like, hey, can you make this decal? Or, hey, I want this for my race car. It's like the classic example. Yeah. I'm going to put this on my car at the <laughs> speedway, and you're going to get all kinds of work. And you know what kind yeah. of work I got? A bunch of other people that wanted free decals for their <laughs> race cars. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the walk-in was never like a, you know, maybe one out of ten. It was like a great source of, of a good customer for us. But yeah, it sounds I, like like completely different opinion on that but I, I i would love to hear it because it has never worked that way for me I, and maybe this is like a small town thing as well like, yeah I, what's, like, the town, what's, what's the town that you're from uh so Strasburg, ohio we're about uh give or take three thousand people our county seat in the county that i'm in i think is fifteen thousand ish yeah um, you might be right you might be right about that brian yeah, we were we were in like sixty five hundred people. Yeah. Uh, I think if I was in like if I was in like so figure like a Maslin or a Canton, which are half an hour from here, I think if I had a storefront city like that where there's forty or fifty thousand, then I think storefronts important. Yeah, um, as as someone who not only built one but several storefront sign shops in my career, I'd probably say there's some there is some validity to your statement in terms of driving traffic, uh, specifically around how many cars per day who will pass your location, right? What, what's what's that visibility, and what the, what is the maximum amount of of visibility that you can you can get, right? If it's a rural market, you know I, I can't really speak to that. I've never lived in a rural market or never placed a sign shop in a rural market. But the fact is, is that all of my locations part of their marketing mix was the fact that you were in a high traffic area, uh, which generated 
organic marketing and organic business a lot faster than I would say a shop in like a business park would, you know, that where you rely heavily on your digital presence. You know, we'd get a walk-in customer. One of my, one of my larger customers came in for, um, okay. So I don't know if I can, I'm trying to think if I could say their name on this podcast or not. So let me just put it this way. It's a very national it's a bit large national beverage company. Okay. okay. And they had these black vans and corporate would send them their decals to be installed on these vans. And this guy just walks in and says, can you take these graphics with this mock-up and install it on this van? I said, sure. You know, it was like 700 bucks and I did it that same day. You know, so a walk-in customer uh, turning into $700 worth of revenue Without, you know, a, a simple, I would say our, we had like a $10 lead acquisition cost at the time. It was very affordable. But you get somebody like that. Now, all of a sudden, that turned into, oh, I have five more vans being shipped. Can you do those also the same day? And I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of getting vans like pretty much five a month. So that was something that we counted on. And it started with uh, a gentleman walking in and saying, one time, can you do this? And can you do it today? So walk-in traffic to me has always been a big part of my marketing mix. I believe that it generates brand awareness is, you know, it'll generate brand awareness for a national brand. It'll generate brand awareness for a mom and pop shop. So I think there is something validity though, that to what you're saying that doesn't work for everybody. If you're, if you position your location incorrectly. So back then we were geared that way though. Like we relied on mm -hmm. that walk-in traffic. And it, it quickly quickly became a thing where we had tons and tons of work that was low paying work that we were just felt like a mouse on the wheel all the time trying to get it all done to where where we sit today, we might only do work for 15 or 20 customers this year. So I. It wasn't, it wasn't in a place where I wanted to be, but we still like, so we'll get inevitably a customer comes in. They're like, Oh, my uncle would love this place. Bring them back. We still do. We do tours of our shop. We do we, people come That's in great. all the time. We, you know, we do our classes, all that stuff. Like I, there's no secrets here. You can see all my stuff. I don't care. Um, but that helps people know how crazy the stuff we do now is. And inevitably, they tell everybody they know, and then we get word of mouth out of that. But back when we were starting out, like we we're just trying to figure stuff out, you know, you'd talk to 15 people in a day and do two jobs. And it, we've never we've never had dedicated sales staff. It's it's me, and I only have so much so many hours in a day. Um, and I also have to run the CNC and the plasma cutter and weld up. You know. So it's just it was a conscious decision to to not there's enough commercial shops around now that take tons of walk-in traffic and that's great they can have that business. Um, I want to create I want to build the signs that are that are the cream of the crop at the top of that. For every hundred people we talk to, we do work for five. Yeah. Hmm. You see, I, like this is the these are the conversations I love to have just because it runs kind of counter to like the average shop that we we talk to of like hey we want to do as much good work as possible like we want all the machines we want all the toys we want to grow 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 um like where was the inflection point in your business right um i would say so when we moved when i bought my partners out we moved into a six thousand square foot factory building um that had some nice offices and everything and at that point, we were doing tons and tons of POP signage for different fixture manufacturers that I had made developed relationships with through the cabinet shop. And we were doing um, we were doing all of the the headers and everything for my grocery stores. Uh, we were doing a ton of work for Skechers shoes, Merrill shoes, um, and I had nine or ten employees at the time. And we got to the end of that year. It was our biggest year ever. We all we almost cracked a million dollars, and um, I didn't make any more money than I did the year before. And I felt like I was just a you know again a mouse on that wheel, just spinning and spinning. And 
I sat down with my wife and I said, listen, I said, I know we did a ton of sales and cash flow was cool and all that. Like it was, it was great. I said, but I'm not having fun anymore. And I, you know, I go back to Dan was one of the guys that, you know, he's like, if you find something that you love to do, you don't work. You don't work a day in your life doing stuff that you love to do. And I turned my shop into this machine where I just felt like a ringmaster, where I was just pointing and telling everybody what to do, and we didn't get to do anything cool. Um, so the next year, we doubled our prices on everything, lost a ton of customers, and went into, started getting into 3D signs and doing the stuff that I love doing and being more creative with things. That's, um, this is super interesting story. Like, was it like, what was your mindset of like, Hey, like we're going to double. It was just like, was it frustration, like desperation of like, Hey, this is just not working for me. Like, were you scared of like, Hey, we're going to double prices. I know we're going to lose customers. Like, are we going to make it? Or was it just like, I don't even care at this point. I, Rather than go on being unhappy and continuing on the path we were, I had to change something to change the way I felt about my business. And the, and the tipping point for that was as I went to Dan's workshop and I looked at how they run things and I'm like, this is exactly what I want to do. You know, this is 100% how I want my shop to be. So I, like, what were, so I, you, you did Dan's workshop, you come back, like uh, these like creative projects are like raining down on you now or like I, i'm curious to know like because there's a there's a lot of guys that we talk to that's why they got into signage you know and we kind of like we find ourselves hey we're doing this work we're doing that work things are things are growing like at, a, at the core there's like the business side and the the artist side a yeah. lot of folks as pete mentioned like we we get into it because we can get paid and create cool shit at the same yeah. time yeah uh so when we got back, we started building samples. And the thing that really put us on the map is we built a, uh, a rusty gear um, that just came straight out, of, straight out of my head. It was this gear with a chain that wrapped around it, and it actually functioned. You could turn it. Um, and that, that got picked up by Coastal Enterprises, and they did a ton of advertising with it. Um, it got published in a couple magazines. Um, and once we started putting pictures of that out there, we started getting a lot of phone calls. Hey, can you make this? Can you make that? Um, we started getting a fair amount of referrals um, through Coastal Enterprises with architects and things. Um, and you know, now we've just got an established relationship with like half a dozen architects that anytime they run into um, these jobs where they want crazy carvings and stuff done, you know, we get that phone call. Is that your uh, target market to go after like architects that are working on yeah yeah such that's extravagant the jobs. is this the one that's the one that's so that's uh six foot tall and uh multi Man, that, looks, that looks that looks real yeah uh it looks like it weighs like five thousand pounds and it weighs like 50 so <laughs> uh, unbelievable <laughs> yeah uh but yeah so we uh that was actually bought by multicam um, they gave us credit on our on our CNC router when our new one whenever we bought it. So that's in their showroom. I believe it's in Grand Rapids. Uh, oh, wow. At Multicam Great Lakes in Grand Rapids, which they've since changed their name. And then that's the second one we built for them. Um, and that one's on display in their Cincinnati showroom. Uh, I, I, insane. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, to show like the level of detail and like, you know, how this is so dramatically different than the average work. Um, because you, you say, uh, I saw Pete's face when you said like 10, 15 customers a year. And he was, he's like, Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering, uh, you know, I, I, I have so many questions around that. Uh, but I would love to get into a business where I own a third and know that I have 15 clients. Like that's it. Like that's yeah. all we're working with. That's, yeah. that's a, that's, that's not only very easy to manage. I'm, I'm assuming cause it's, very intimate relationships and it's not as chaotic as hundreds or thousands of clients uh, a year. But walk me through, uh, if that's the type of work that you were doing or are still doing, walk me through like the, what is the expectations of your client? Even though you have only a few of them, what is the, their expectations? How does it go through your shop? What's the turnaround time and what are expectations for them? 
do they give you creative control? It's, I mean, it's a give and take, but I, one thing I want to preface that with is we have been very lucky in that we have, we've got two, three clients that we do work for that basically cover our overhead. They are recurring clients. Um, we print a ton of safety signage and a, a just it's the same thing over and over again, and it just changed based on the sites where they put them at. Um, so it all has to be custom, but it's the same thing every time with different wording. And that's all flatbed printed. And, um, you know, we, we typically sub out our flatbed printing. Um, so that stuff, we design it, we sub out the flatbed printing, they come here, we distribute to the client. And it, that gives us a lot of flexibility in how we can run the rest of the business. Okay, so two questions there for, for – I think you might have just given me some insight into one. Uh, how, did you, how did you acquire this client that, that pays your overhead? Uh, super fast response. We got a phone call. Uh, the company was um, just moving into the area. They called 10 local sign shops. Uh, we, we designed, prototyped, and delivered prototypes in five days um, and won the whole won the whole – account for the state of Ohio. So this speed to this speed to lead approach, right? You got the initial inquiry out of the way. You were very quick with it. You um, did, was there any quoting or estimating involved or was it? Uh, there was. So the prototyping yep. and the estimating all happened at the same time. So you charge for a prototype? Uh, we we did not for the first run. You did not. For um, we just we just did it because we knew I mean, just it's the oil and gas industry. They moved into Ohio 10 years ago, and it was, I mean, it, it was crazy. Um, so we, we prototyped that first run. We set up a sales system where they can just fill out a spreadsheet, send it to us. We build all the signs. We pack that spreadsheet. And then we, you know, one of the big things was is when they moved in, they were adamant that they had to have 90-day terms. And a lot of people were like, nope, can't do it. And I'm like, I'll take that account. It only hurts whenever you got to wait the first 90 days. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we were, so we were very, very accommodating with them and we always, we delivered on time. And then when a couple of employees left there to went for other oil and get work for other oil and gas companies, we snagged them too. So we're doing like the three biggest oil and gas companies in Ohio now. To that, a lot, uh, a lot of my clients, a lot of my sign shop owners that I, uh, consult with have have broached this question to me many times, and that's should I be looking at ninety day terms with some of my clients? So what may, led you to say yes to that one client in particular? Um, when others side, would normally say no, you said I'll take that client. But what went into that decision? So we negotiated with them that as long as they were ordering stock items, they got ninety day terms. But anytime they did anything custom. They had to pay up front. Oh, so you customize the terms to the demand, to the need. Yes. Yes. Well, and that's a very interesting strategy. Yeah, inevitably, they ended up ordering a lot of custom stuff, and that really helped us float the 90-day terms on the rest of the stuff. Did you have to outline what was a standard item and what was a custom item? Yeah. Not they, too many people had, would know what that is. Yeah, no, they had like 15 items that were a standard off-the-shelf that we could just print and keep them in stock. And then anything that that went outside of those fifteen items was custom. Very interesting. I'm, I learned something here today with that. That's great. I never even thought in my career to tailor make the terms to the product deliverable. Interesting, interesting concept. So good. So you probably landed that client because they were like, "Oh my God, this company is going to give us the terms," and they're being very flexible. And I think that's the key word that I'll use there. You were flexible uh, in accommodating their terms. How many other clients do you have on on uh, terms like this? Uh, we have two others. That and and typically they're typically we don't go out go out past sixty days with anybody. Okay. And, and one of them. So we've got. Two oil and gas that are like 90-day clients, and then we've got a 60-day client that we also do safety signage for, and then we've got a 30-day as well. And then, like, all the custom stuff is yeah. you just separate and, like, paid up front. Like, yeah. But yep. That's nice. I, it seems like you've got, like, the, this good balance of – and you said you're outsourcing all of it, right? What do you what, – what toys do you still have in-house? Because it uh, wouldn't be the episode if we didn't talk at, at least no. about what the toys. So we've got – we have seven 3D printers in-house now. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. Um, so we have uh, we've got a CNC plasma cutter that'll uh, do up to one inch steel, and then we've got a five by ten uh, Multicam three thousand series uh, that does all of our our three D carving and everything. Um, and we also you know process aluminum panels with it and stuff and. You know, back when sure. we had a flatbed, we had the Envision system put on that, so we would print and go out and do optical registration, cut all of our stuff up. But now everything comes in sized. Yeah, so you got rid of the flatbed. Yeah. And, they, like, all that work is outsourced now. Yeah, so we bought the flatbed when the oil and gas stuff started, and it allowed us to be very fast um, with our response time. So it was a great investment at the time. But then there was a, there was a downturn and a $3,000 a month payment on a flatbed gets a little bit a little bit uh, annoying yeah. whenever you're not it's that overhead right you need another yeah. you need another on-term client to handle that yeah. payment right yeah so we had one of our customers had bought the same flatbed for doing other things and they were extremely interested in buying ours because you couldn't get it anymore because they knew it in, inside and out so we ended up selling it for a you know an okay profit you know once once you looked at owning it for five years and we started subbing everything out because I had a I had a dedicated guy on staff that all he did was the flatbed because they're they're I mean they're at least this one was it was high maintenance come in every morning purge the heads wipe them get all your colors back it just it took it was an hour hour and a half every morning to get that thing functioning properly you know so we had another whole guy on staff just to run that thing. So when a when a buddy of mine who does own wholesale only stuff, which actually his shop burned down. <laughs> oh my god! You know, don't laugh I'll about it. Add, add it to the add it to the list. A lady ran off the road, hit the propane tank, it caught on fire and burned the shop down. Jeez. So uh, yeah. Okay, that's so crazy. He, yeah, he came in. He's like, "Hey, we're I'm setting up a new place. Uh, we're a subsidiary of this other company. I'm managing everything." Um, we're going to be able to do flatbed printed ACM and PVC and all this stuff for, for X amount of dollars. And when I sat down and looked at our, what it cost us to get the material, to keep the machine running, to pay for the machine, uh, it, I mean, it, we're paying like 50 cents on a dollar of what we were not doing it ourselves. So it was like, get this thing out of here. <laughs> we're subbing flatbed print out from now on. Well, and I, I think like in this day and age, like hey, there's a lot to be said for having the equipment in house. But like, if that's not what you want to do, that's not like that doesn't that's not where you bring the value. I, you know, if that's if that's not your ideal shop, like there's so many good partners that you can outsource that to, and the equipment just becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And they're 20 minutes from my shop. Like I don't even have to pay shipping. I run up there once a week and I grab everything. Well, that was going to be my next question. Where are you outsourcing this to? This is uh, somebody local or a national yeah, company? So, they, so they've got uh, four five-meter machines and two uh, two flatbeds. Their one flatbed will do like 100 sheets an hour. I mean, it's, it's crazy fast. So they do all of our yard signs, all of our printed ACM, all of our printed PVC. They do backlit faces for us. Um, any of that stuff that we just – that we're just not interested in doing here. Um, you know, and, and the markups on like what it costs for me, like so we we buy material, we ship it into their factory, it sits on their floor, and they just charge us for printing on our material. Oh wow, those are those are very favorable terms. Well, uh, care to give them a plug because I want I might want to use them. Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's imagine this, imagine this, uh, they're they're out of uh, out of Maslin, Ohio. Um, if you want to get a hold of the Imagine sales guy there, his name's Eric Baker. Eric. Uh, awesome dude. They they do tons and tons of work for us, and they've always done a really good job. Super cool to work with. So, all right. So on a side note, Brian, we need to start looking for sponsors for this podcast in the <laughs> fire prevention space. <laughs> the fire <laughs> prevention space. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, it, uh, if we uh, have this many shops going on fire, use this company. Yeah. 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 I, I, it's just crazy. Like I said, yeah, I, I'd never would have expected Jim to throw that story out there, but yeah, it's just, we've interviewed I'm quite a few. Yeah. In, in, it's, I, I just can't believe how many people this has happened to. I mean, like buy yourself a fire extinguisher for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Do yourself a favor. 
public service announcement. Put a cert, put a fire extinguisher in every room of your shop. In fact, I got to tell you, do you ever have uh, this is kind of like our off off the cuff question, but do you guys have like those fire suppression people coming into your shop door and saying, "Hey, you, know, you need to get your tags put on your your fire extinguisher and it's going to cost you $100." Do you have that? Oh my god. So in New York here, I guess this is a New York thing then. Like there are, there are companies that go into your business and say, uh, "Let me check your fire extinguisher and see if it's expired." And they and they do expire. And if they expired, well, guess what? You could get fined for that. So they like charge you a hundred bucks to put a new service tag on it to say <laughs> that it works. It's the most ridiculous oh, business wow. model. Yeah. It's to prevent you from getting fined by like the state or or county or whatever. I thought that that was everywhere, but th I guess it's just friggin' New York. It sounds like protection <laughs> to me. <laughs> Where's my envelope? <laughs> hey, li listen, you gonna, you gonna you gonna pay it to us or you gonna really pay it to? Like the you're state. Gonna pay it to, like, you're gonna pay it to us, or you're gonna pay it to Mr. Sam. Yeah, can't get anyway. it. This place won't burn, burn down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they really they really put the thought that like, hey, in case of a fire, you're gonna get sued. I'm like, oh my god! All right, here, here's a hundred bucks. Just get out of my shop. Put the tags I, on the know, fire extinguishers. If, if we were a bigger place and had more people working here, like that stuff becomes, you know, much more important than than it is to me now. But I mean. I, you know, I've got two employees and we have very few things in here. Like we got the plasma and the laser. Those are the things that will start fires, you know, and my, my building's 17 inch thick concrete. Oh, well, you know, it's not, it's not going to burn. <laughs> yeah. So, trust yeah. me we've tried <laughs> there was that one time we were hard up back in the day <laughs> no uh, uh, like trying to get this back back on track I, like walk us through like it, we talked about the clients that are paying the overhead like walk us through these creative projects like uh, you're working with architects I, I imagine uh, probably a few other folks like how do those projects progress how do they come in like, what's the workflow look like? Yeah, so uh, we're working on one right now for a very, very large internet company that we're working with a, a um, backup. We did a 16-foot-tall dog bone for the city of Chicago for an architect three, four years ago. Like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like, like, a, like a dog bone? Like a, like yeah, a like a, bone? on a steel post. It went in a, in a concrete poured base. It's 16 feet tall, and it says the name of the of the dog park on it oh, and it's got really cool. perimeter led lighting i mean all kinds of crazy stuff well that was this architect called said hey can you build a 16 foot dog bone and i'm like yeah i can build anything you know and like like everything you hang up and you're like okay i gotta figure out how to do this so <laughs> um yeah and that and that is that is all of our our custom jobs like everyone that comes in it's like i got a good grasp of how to build things, but everyone is so different that it, there are a lot of research and figuring out what's the best way and and how can we make it cost effective. Um, so you know we did the we did the dog bone. Um, we didn't do any work for him for probably it's probably been two or three years. And he called me up. He's like, hey, we've got this client in Austin, Texas. Uh, we we need to do these things. Um, we're going to send you some files. Let's prototype it. Um, and we're in the middle of that one right now. And I, that's going to be, that job will take us about a month. And um, it's, it's a bunch of carved wave wall patterns. And it's these crazy tree things that go on the walls. And, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's nice to be in, in the, the, the mind of an architect or a designer when they come up with these, these things that they want to make happen. And they're not sure how to make it happen, but you're the guy they think of whenever that comes up. So a couple of follow-up questions to that. So I mentioned earlier, so is this a target market for you? Are you going after when you acquire customers? Are you not acquiring end users? You're going after architects as your customer? We have, so we have tried to go in the front door of architecture firms and it never works. I don't know why. 
like whenever we do mailers or if we try to like stop in or anything like that, like architects are very, very straight line, square, this stuff has to line up type people, most of them. Sure. Uh, it, takes, it takes special architects and special designers to be able to utilize the things that we want to do. Um, so there's a few of them out there that we've been dealing with over the years that have the creative vision for stuff like that. And, you know, typically those are, it's a word of mouth thing or, you know, somebody will approach Coastal Enterprises. We got this project we need to do. How will we do this? And Coastal inevitably says, well, we just make the material, but here's our fab guy. Yeah. And I'm sure that this is a good rep or a really great representation of their work too, as an architect, like when they're putting together their drawings and whatnot, what they can propose, you know, when they're proposing it to, I don't know, a builder, a, a, a whatever. Uh, that they can be armed with some some uh, additional services, knowing that you're in their arsenal versus some other architect. So I can see it being very valuable for not only you but for them as well. But do you deal direct with the client or directly with the architect? We we always deal with the architect. Okay, um, so there's, there's, the architect there's... is the one that's kind of controlling the budget and yes. the scope of work. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There's been a few situations where they've made an introduction. Um, but it seems to always go more smoothly when we deal with the architect. There's also jobs that kind of, that we kind of come in exactly opposite of that, where we just did, uh, I don't know if you saw the big, the uh, Encore Hotel Amish Country Theater sign, which was in Signs of the Times a couple years ago. That sign, the end user came straight to us because they knew we did crazy stuff. So then we started dealing with, with our engineers and an architect to get all of that in place. And, and so we kind of went at that one from, here's our concept. We gave that to the engineer and the architect, and then they made that work for for the project. Uh, super curious, like, are you charging like on the front end of these? Because it, like drawings, uh, you just research, like I mean, the stuff that you do is, it's absolutely phenomenal. But like, I, I imagine there's a, a lot invested in like getting it to a point where you can even quote it. Yeah, so on the the hotel sign that we did, that one was, I believe we got a retainer up front on that one to develop all the designs and everything. Um, and then that came off of the, the, the final billing on the project. Everything else, so the, arch, the architects typically have everything to a point where I can just throw them numbers up front. They've got it developed enough that I can put budget numbers together. And then we take those budgets and we tighten them as we whittle down what, what the project's actually going to be. But we do, we do take deposits. Um, they're all over the place. We like to get 50% down most of the time. Um, okay. When we're dealing with architects and big projects, sometimes it's, it's set out in draws. Like we get 33% up front, 33% in 30 days, 33% when we deliver. Just, you know, because a lot of times we're working on that project for a month. They've got to pay our overhead for that month so that we can build their stuff. That's an interesting, that's kind of segueing into my question here. It's an interesting way of thinking. You got a pro one project is taking your bandwidth up for the entire month. So not only do you have to make your profit for the month, you have to cover your, your overhead, your payroll, whatever, you know, whatever that looks like. What is your pricing method for these types of projects? I have a spreadsheet that I've been using for 20 years. And that spreadsheet has my profit margins figured into it. It has my overhead figured into it, my cost of material, what that material gets marked up when it comes through my door, how long my machining time is, how long my labor time, my design time. And I put all, everything that I know based on my 20 years of experience into that spreadsheet and it spits out a number. The only adjustable thing in those numbers is what the profit margin is. So some things that we do have a really high profit margin because they're gonna be hard to do and other things you know it's 25 30 percent uh so on and you base that off of a gut feeling or you base that off of like the the design what is the what is the level of difficulty what goes into the the thought process behind is this an easy project or is this a complex project yeah well i, I mean obviously if we're doing like two and a half d stuff that's hanging on a wall 
or you know it just has to be this size and i i know that stuff's going to be easy when we're doing full 3d in the round and i get to build steel armatures and we're sculpting concrete and we're carving foam you know that just goes up in the in the complexity scale um so that's what's the, the stuff most, what's Go the ahead. most uh two questions what's the most expensive project you've worked on and how long did it take you to produce so this is a loaded question because whenever we did the when we did the Merrill shoes and the Skechers shoes and stuff like that, it was nothing for us to do a hundred thousand dollar contract, but that would be split up over, you know, six, eight weeks. And they wouldn't need everything at one time. So we would just kind of work on those in the background. But as far as like one one solid job where we had to build the whole thing and it was all at one time, um, I would say we worked on the the Encore Hotel Amish Country Theater sign for two months solid. And that that project I think it came in around 150,000. So that gives me a little bit more uh, of an understanding of what goes into this type of work. I mean, yes, 150,000 over two months, breaking that down over, you know, $75,000 a month in terms of the, the total shops bandwidth on working on this project. I mean, do you have any other bandwidth in your system to take on oh, additional work? Absolutely. We were, we were still doing work that whole time. Concrete's got to dry. You got, you know, there's, there was always these, I would say if I had to guess, probably 50 to 60% of our days were spent on that project in that two month time period. There's still work that's other work that's got to go out the door though yeah, yeah. I get it yeah i mean we were um, doing all the all the safety signage in that time we were doing you know we were still doing all of our other stuff it's just i i typically won't like i would never take on two complicated jobs like that at one time yeah. makes sense yeah I, I like there's a few conversations we've had on the podcast with with other folks that were like hey like how do we balance these resources and that's where like you, you got to focus on the stuff that you're good at and like re be really honest with yourself of like, Hey, what do we want to do? What are we good at? Like, sh yes, we could do this job in house. Is it, it's going to tie up the printer for a week. Does it make sense to actually do that given the rest of the workload or should we just like outsource it? Well, and I know Dan, whenever he was on the podcast, he talked to you about his, you know, the five things that decide whether they accept a job or not. Yep. And and we swear by that. I mean, it's it's one of the like the the thing in the sign industry that I at least for custom shops like ours that people don't realize is that the whole opportunity cost of things. Like if you take on a job that you hate for a customer that doesn't appreciate the type of work that you do, and you tie yourself up for thirty days, I will guarantee you there's going to be a cherry of a job come in that you wanted to do that you had to say no to. You know, so it's it's that whole checklist. Like, are, am I going to make good money? Do I have creative control? Um, do I have time? Will they wait? You know, that whole checklist that Dan goes, like, it works. Uh, I will have to link back to that episode in the show notes. Um, <laughs> I want to, uh, hey, like, get you uh, on the soapbox, Jim. Uh, you know, you do the workshops. Uh, you know, we had previously discussed, like, the HDU project. But, uh, like, if we... Like, is there anything you want to get on the soapbox? Like, you've been in the industry a long time. Like, is there anything you wanted to, like, explicitly say to listeners out there right now? Yeah, I, um, I'm i encouraged by the whole the maker movement coming back and people doing things with their hands and actually appreciating quality again. You know, I mean, for, the, for a good part of the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s, like, I mean, a lot of signage went to, I mean, it, Everybody went to the Walmart mentality. How quick can I get it? How fat? How it doesn't have to be great. I just need it. I think the discerning palate or people's expectations of what's good and what's not are finally starting to come back around. At least that's what I've seen. Like I, we're getting a lot of calls from people that could just throw a piece of aluminum up on a post and they want carved signs now. And my, my whole, my whole point with that stuff is, is like if you can drive down any main street, especially in my area, and there's tons and tons of backlit signs and aluminum boxes, you know, they've got their, you know, they've got their usefulness. But if you want people to stop and take note of something, you need to do something different. And for us to put out 
a, a sign out there that people don't stop and take a picture of or, or grab a selfie in front of it or um, it just, I have to put my name on that and I don't want my name on stuff that isn't awesome. So we, that drives us to turn a lot of work down. Got it. I, yeah, I, I, like I've noticed that trend. I, I'm happy to see it. And, and like, I love having conversations with a, like craftsmen like yourself that a, like really, I, I just get it. You know, like a, a being in the industry for so long, like you look at all the signs, like I still go through the airport and like I look at stuff and I'm like feeling and, and my wife, it drives her crazy. But like, you know, I, I, these things you, like you pick up on and it's easy to tell, like, a, a, like it's measurable in people, like the reaction that they have to something like the, the pieces that you guys do and Dan does and Shane or, or Jace uh, Fox, like their stuff, like it, it generates these emotions versus like the, the flat panel, red lettering. <laughs> it just, yeah. Yeah. It well, just that, doesn't generate that. That was our reason for starting up the sign invitational. You know, Dan, Dan and I were in Colorado teaching at a, uh, at a en route seminar and um, we're sitting on the grass outside eating lunch. And I looked at him, I'm like, I'm like, you remember when you guys did the, the um the sign contest in signcraft that was the mechanical fish contest and he's like yeah he's like why don't we do that again like let's just let's just invite 20 amazing sign makers let's give them a prompt and see what they build and th and that was the beginning of the sign invitational and it like that first one that we had man oh my gosh it was the who's who of like it was when we showed up for that thing like it was you know cuz we had we had Peter Panessa there, uh, Roger Cox, myself, Dan, uh, Doug Hancock was in it. Like we had all of these people that like just made awesome dimensional signs, and the amount of traffic in that booth that day, from even people that just do, you know, aluminum channel letters and stuff, that were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, so it, we kept it up for three or four years and COVID ended up killing it because we didn't have a trade show for a couple of years. And yeah, I, I, I like I would love to see you guys get back to it. But yeah, I, I can remember seeing all those projects in I, I don't think I made the, the shows, I, maybe one of them. But I, I can remember seeing them in the magazines and I was like, holy, like this is this is the pinnacle. Yeah, it um, kind of blurred the line between prop making and sign making and, and, and sure. culture and but that's. Like that's that's my happy place, you know. Like I like we're doing we're doing stuff with signs now that, like that's what we've got seven three D printers here. People are like show me a sign shop anywhere that's. You know, I mean, I can name you a few guys because I've been watching them online, but nobody's doing that much stuff with it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, unless I you, unless you've got three hundred thousand to put it in one of those massive it machines and just print six foot tall sneakers and you know that's that's yeah. stuff that we'll look at like you know at subbing out whenever a job like that comes if we can't just sculpt it. But you know I, I have a sculptor on staff now, um, so you know he does he does a lot of that that work for us. So we'll sculpt stuff in clay and then we'll three D scan it and then then we can clean it up. In, uh, on, on our iPads. We usually do a lot of 3D modeling on the iPads now. And uh, then we send it out to the 3D printers and we make copies and things. I, it's just such a different like slice of the industry. It's, it, it's like one of my favorite things about the podcast. And I, I think Pete agrees of just like seeing a different slice than, than what we were in and being able to, to learn of like how you run your business. It, it, like it, I think we're, we're closing in on time, but uh, tell us about the workshops. Tell us about the, like the HDU material project, like company you're, you're starting. Okay. Yeah. So the, uh, the workshops, we try to do those twice a year. Typically they're in May and October. Uh, if anybody wants to go check it out, it's at uh, uh, signalchemy.com. That's what we call it because we're taking piles of junk and turning them into gold. So um yeah, so that that's the class. Uh, it's a it's a two and a half day class. Uh, you learn more than you would ever want to in two and a half days, and we send you home tired and and wondering about 
your existence and if you've made the wrong places. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, so is it uh, is it just about like sculpting and, and like three D signage? Or? So we do both. the The one we do in the fall is a little bit more heavy into. Um, we've got everything basically carved already, so it's a lot more embellishing and painting and doing special effects like my rust effect on the gear, uh, things like that, just to just to help people develop a repertoire of, of finishing and different ways to do things. Um, and then they also learn a fair amount of sculpting and, and we touch on making molds and casting and what you do with your 3D prints and all that stuff in that workshop too. Now our one that we do in May typically is real heavy armature, building your armatures, uh, covering those armatures, putting concrete on those armatures, sculpting, uh, on top of that with with a fiberglass reinforced concrete um, so the, the it's we try to keep them separate so that if people want to come concentrate on one they don't have to be bored with things so we do two and a half days in the fall two and a half days in the spring so th this spring will be the concrete will be um, I don't know if I showed you pictures of the of the the playhouse that I'm building for my kids that's straight out of Gal Star Wars Galaxy's Edge like it's huge it's 30 feet tall. Tons and oh, tons wow. of sculpted concrete, steel. Um, I can I can send you guys some pictures of it whenever. Yeah, we're... yeah, we'll we'll definitely link it in the the show notes. But I, I think what we're going to do is there's enough work left on that that we can really take people and put them on a project, and then they can actually do things that are going to matter and actually stay there when they get done. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's what the spring one's going to be. Is since there's so much concrete left work left to do, we're going to take everybody and work on that project. So that's awesome. No, I, I love, I, I would love to attend the workshop and I, like, I always wanted to do Dan's workshops, but it was, it was always a haul to get up there to where he was at. It's awesome to have somebody who like a, does work in the same vein and, and like, you know, like you've added your own layer to it as well, uh, locally or well, I, at least on more the East Coast where it's, yeah, more, <laughs> more local than Dan, I, we'll put it that way. No. Yeah, but the, but the other thing we're starting up now is we're starting a um, a supply company. It'll be a separate entity from Synergy. We're already doing a little bit with it on on Etsy, but we're going to actually put up a um, a store where you can go buy uh, smaller pieces of HDU, ACM, and acrylic. And we're also going to sell three D printed embellishments for signs. Like if you ever want to put rivets on a sign, yeah, we've got we do these uh, rivets that we put on signs that are it's. It is the best rivet system in the world. Uh, it's you, you basically screw a receiver onto a sign and you snap a rivet over the top. And it's, oh, wow. it's yeah, so you, it, you, can, you can add rivets, bolt heads, uh, any of this stuff to any sign just as embellishments. So those will be on there. We're gonna bring in um, full sheets of, of precision board. We're gonna cut those down into UPSable sizes um, because right now the industry, like if, so if I'm starting out in my garage again, and I want to do a two foot by three foot sign for somebody. And I want to carve that on my little hobby CNC. I have to spend, you know, minimum of five, 600 bucks for a sheet. It's going to cost me that again to get it shipped there. And then how do I get a skid that weighs three or 400 pounds off of a truck at my house? So there's not a lot of places out there that are cutting, cutting HDU down or doing like, we're going to do ovals. We're going to do rounded rectangles. Uh, you. Like, okay. you know, if you want to order a custom, um, and we'll give you the template for that so you can set that all up on your router so you know it carves straight and everything. And um, so we're going to we're gonna bring material in, size it down, make it UPSable. You can order it from our online store. We'll pack it up and ship it out UPS. Love it. Yeah. So because uh, there's this the, the maker movement, like those guys, a lot of those guys have smaller CNCs and they're in their garage and none of them, you know, they're they're still carving signs out of wood. And then, you know, five, six years in, like the paint starts fading and it's taken on water and i'm like well why don't you use hdu well i can't get it anywhere well that's a problem yeah yeah and there's a there's enough of those you know, like prosumers you know it's kind of like the is it like hobbyists or is it like people who are trying to like you sell would, you just like handmade like you know like so hey, you got just, you got just uh, producing you've got people that are in that gray area between between just starting up and actually running one heck of an Etsy business where they sell a ton of stuff on there, you know, it's a problem for them. It's a problem for sign shops starting out. Like I remember when I ordered my first HDU order, like thankfully I was established enough then 
that for me to call an order 10 grand worth of HDU wasn't a huge ordeal, but it would have been like five years before that, it would have been, you know, I, I would have never got started. You know, like it's, that's spending 1200 bucks on a sheet of material and putting it up on your router is, you want to, you know, there's times when you screw up a $1,200 sheet of material starting out that it's the end. Yeah. I had that same issue when we, we had like a laser engraver. We started getting into like the glass awards, which were like the market for those, like the margins were great, but one single crystal award, it's like $30. And once you, once you etch that bad boy and like it, 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 there's like it chips or something doesn't come out right. Like you're killing the profit on the job. Yeah. Well, and what if you've just got an operator if they're hitting the go button and he doesn't know what looks really good <laughs> yeah. or not? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. It's scary. Well, that sounds like an interesting project. Do you guys have a website or up anything up for it yet or no? Uh, no, not yet. We're still, we're still working on, I've got some names that we're making sure everything's <laughs> available for. And uh, once we get that all set up, um, we've got uh, we've we've got our distribution all set up for the other company um, and stuff like that, so we know where we're going to be getting our materials at and everything, and and so that's going to be um, we're also going to be selling tooling on there as well. So uh, we have a really good really good uh, relationship with XEdge. We've been working with them for years, and we've actually designed a few tools that they sell. And people call me all the time. Hey, what what tool are you using for three D carving? Because there's, you know, there's these eighth inch bits out. You want to use an eighth inch ball and mill to get really nice detail. And if you put an eighth inch ball and mill in your, in your machine and you carve two inches deep, it snaps off. It's not. So we designed a tapered head mill that because of the taper, you're not, you're not carving with the taper, but you're giving way more strength to that mill. And so we've, we've developed a good relationship with them. So we're going to sell those tapered heads and we're going to do some, some collabs where we, like these 10 bits are what you need to start doing 3D carving and we'll sell that as a set. And yeah. so we're going to do some stuff like that as well. It's super interesting to see like your path from like, hey, super generalist, like the average, I won't say the average, but like the, the standard sign shop stuff all the way into, it feels like you've just gone like, hey, this is explicitly what I want to do. And now you're going deeper and deeper into that of like, even like, how can I enable other sign makers to get into this? But even if you're at home and you, like, hey, I've, I've just bought a, a tabletop CNC router, you want to get into this. Let me enable you to do that too. Yeah, well, there, there's two things driving that. And I, you know, when Dan and I, when we get together and talk, like for so long when I was starting out, everybody held everything real close to their vest. There wasn't a lot of people that were, that were teaching other people. And I think I think that's what happened to the sign industry. I think it 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 developed into a thing where I I've just got to do the stuff that I know how to do because the, the there wasn't a lot of training, there wasn't a lot of sharing of ideas, and you know I I promised him, you know, 15 years ago when we met that it was anything you teach me I'm going to share, and when I've learned stuff I'm going to share with you, and and my phone's always on and my email's always open like I I've never ever taken an email from somebody with a question and not replied or not helped them. Like I'll get on the phone and spend an hour with somebody helping them through whatever their problem is. And, you know, it's just, it's me giving back to the industry that's done so much for me. You know what? We started this call today uh, and we talked about what would happen if we won the mega millions, right? That's how we started talking about the intro when we were uh, just catching up, Brian and I, and I okay. just realize what I would do if, if I won the mega millions, what's that? I'm going to reach out to you. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you and I are going to create a sign shop school and a university. We're going to create a, and give back to this community. It's something quite literally that is in my opinion, the more and more that we do these calls, the more and more I talk to professionals, creative professionals, business professionals, a, 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 some sort of technical school for this industry is needed. In my opinion, you know, like you got some uh, basic courses, advanced courses, and then like what I would consider like AP courses, like, hey, here's how to use this multicam and, <laughs> and how to do 3D carving. I mean, t the curriculum in this industry can start foundationally at graphic design and printing 
or vinyl cutting. And it goes all the way up to the things that you're doing here, Jim. And quite honestly, there's not too many people in this world that could do what you're providing. And it was uh, amazing getting to know you, amazing hearing your story. A lot of sign shop owners can uh, probably relate to some of the things here that you've discussed. But the fact of the matter is, is that you are in a group of uh, what I, I'll still call you a sign shop owner, but you're in a group that not too many people are involved in. And it's amazing to get an inside look at how different your business model is compared to the other 98% of us that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you really want to hear, you want to hear my pie in the sky idea before we hang up here? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. my God. Yes. Okay. So I want to five years from now, I want to, I want to sell my shop. All I want to do is trainings and help other sign shops. Um, so you're the right I, guy for the you're the right guy for the school. You're the principal yeah. of my university. <laughs> <laughs> so so what I want to do is get take my family, get in a motorhome, pull a trailer, um, twofold. Uh, number one, we have a lot of really great sign makers that are getting up there in age, that I think it warrants a video camera and spending some time with them and learning as much as we can from those guys. And I want to go visit them um, because I've lost a couple really good friends in the sign industry over the last three or four years to, to, to various things. And I, I'd give anything to be able to sit down with those guys for an hour and, and learn from them. Um, and it's not possible anymore. So I've got a short list of these guys that I want to go sit down with and learn from. Number two, I'd like to bounce just from city to city showing people like, Here's here are the things that I've discovered in 20 years and and this stuff all works. You know, quit quit spinning your wheels. Um, this stuff works. If you want to do 3D, here's the stuff I use for that. Here's the stuff I use for this. Um, I for for way too long there's not been there's been no authority out there for things like that. And I have no idea how I'm paying for this. <laughs> so <laughs> I, like like in a, in, in a perfect world you get it you. You these companies that I've been dealing with for all this time, um, we go out and we push their product, and and they they pay for this. Or I don't know if it becomes a consulting business, or I don't know, yeah. I don't know how this all works. But I just want to travel around and meet cool people and interview them and put it out there for everybody. And if we can stop and help people that are getting started, or people that I need to learn things along, I like I would love to do that. Like that's my pipe. I love it. it. It's given back. It's traveling. I mean, I, I, I haven't, I've traveled to seven states in my life. I mean, that's boring. Wow. That's <laughs> boring, right? Yeah. Uh, so getting in an RV with you and, and, and seeing the world, I would love to yeah. do something like that. Yeah. I mean, look, if I win the Mega Millions, maybe that's going to be at the top of my list. Awesome. The better I, sign I shop that. road trip. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half Let's days. We have it's mobile, man. Yeah, the two and a half days we have at our class that we teach twice a year are the are the best days of my year. I can, I, and I get the sense from that. I get it comes yeah. out of your it comes out of your tone. Like it's it, I can tell that you care more. I wouldn't say more, but you you care passionately about education, about teaching, giving back. And I have a question, to, uh, just as a follow up to something that you mentioned. You said that you would love to go and like educate to like you know these sign shop owners that are thinking about getting into three D. That's a step in, that's a significant step, right? Like, so as a sign shop owner, uh, I can comfortably say I have never done 3D signs. You know, uh, 2D CNCing, that's basically, you know, flat wall signage, maybe a couple of like three, four layers. That's about all I've ever got into projects with. So I'm not one of those guys that would take the kindly to 3D sign making, just knowing what equipment I need to buy, what goes into it, the space, the craft, it's significant. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I mean, the barrier to entry is now yeah. it's not what it was when I started. When I started in order to get that sign that we do a 3D carving, it was fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 You can now buy like say a Shapoko or a, a, X, a Stepcraft or some of those other small hobby CNCs for five grand. Um, so it's 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 do it's yeah. the barrier to entry to getting now where where you differentiate is not everybody can see things in 3D. They don't I, can, have, I, I agree with that. I agree yeah, with that. So that's where 
two big barriers. Can you can you imagine things in 3D or not? Number one. Number two, the software to learn to do 3D carving and stuff like that is if you don't have help and you don't have somebody showing you the ropes is daunting. Um, when I started with Enroute, I had no help. I had to help the whole thing. And, and, and to be quite honest with you, when I started with Enroute, it was a, it was a nightmare for me because I had no support structure. I can go into, we've done, I've done probably a dozen trainings all over the U.S. and Canada now with Enroute. Like I'll go in and show people what they're doing wrong with their CNC, how to use Enroute. Um, the more advanced places will keep me there for a couple extra days and we'll do the 3D stuff. I typically could go into a shop and in two days, we can be milling their first 3D project. I'm going to put you in touch with somebody that would love to take advantage of that. Uh, I'll, I'll get with you offline about it. Jim, we're just about out of time here. Thank you so much for, for jumping in and giving us your story. I loved this interview tremendously. Uh, I'm going to look to touch base with you offline on a number of things, but thank you so much for being a guest here. And uh, is there anything that you'd like to plug, plug your business here? Yes, uh, SynergySign.com, Sign Alchemy for the classes. Um, if you want to see all of our latest and greatest projects that we're working on, uh, just hit us up, Synergy Sign on Instagram. That's usually the most updated thing that we have have going. So last thing, you got like I got to send props out to Dan, Dan Swatsky, because that was that was my pivot point. Um, I went to that class and and literally changed the trajectory of, me, of my business. And he's been a great friend and a great mentor over the years. And and that's what I'm looking to start doing for the next group of people coming up. So Dan has been awesome. I want to pay that back. So that's that's why I, I want to do these classes and everything. So there you have it. Jim, um, amazing, man. I knew this was going to be a good episode when we had our initial conversation. And I'm I, I'm sorry it took us so long to coordinate, but well, I'm I was so start, happy that we did. <laughs> I was starting to think. I'm like, well, you know, I, uh, I talked to Brian and uh, he said he'd be in touch. I, maybe I'm just not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was never you. It's me. Yeah. It's not you. It's me. <laughs> uh, hey, Jim, thanks again, man. Hey, this thank has been you. Great. Thanks, Jim. A pleasure. And that's it for this episode. I'd like to take a minute to thank our awesome sponsors. A big thank you to GCI Digital Imaging, grand format printer to the trade. GCI is not just your average print shop. They pride themselves on providing you with a fast, stress-free experience when outsourcing. Their no excuses mindset means no matter the job, they'll have it done on time, every time. No other vendor will go to the links that GCI does to ensure you're a satisfied customer. To hear more about their approach to business, hop back in the archives to episode nine, where the guys and I interview owner TJ Bedact about top tier customer experience. So if you're looking for a high quality trade printer for banners, mesh, core plast, and more, TJ and his crew have your back. Big or small, GCI does them all. Check them out at printgci.com. Flat cut acrylic letters and logos are a great way to drive impact for your clients and increase your profit margins on a job. They're super simple to install, but are notoriously tough to produce without the right equipment and processes. So why bother yourself when there's a good cut acrylic provider with quick turnaround and great communication? Check out Jayco Wholesale Sign Products at sign.supply slash BSS. They're not scared of intricate designs and their process ensures the edges and corners of your logos or letters are spot on. And that's not all. They offer a variety of mounting options like VHB or stud mount, Pantone matching for those tough clients acrylic up to one inch thick and fast nationwide shipping. Visit Jayco Wholesale Sign Products at sign.supply slash BSS to get a quote for your next project and mention you heard about them on the show to receive $50 off your first order. If you liked this episode, make sure you hit subscribe to get all the latest episodes and check out our website, bettersignshop.com. Get free resources and helpful tools on growing your shop. Thanks for listening.